Let's pray. Lord in heaven, we open our hearts to you this morning. We invite you to fill us with your spirit. Please shape our minds and our hearts. Inspire us with courage. Give us comfort where we need it. And prepare us for service in the week to come. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Part of the meaning of church is worship. It's God directed. We come here to to help each other lift our faith. And when I talk about each other, we're then thinking about community. You know, it's we're we're in this together. We're together as a congregation here at Green Lake, and then Green Lake is a part of the larger community, the Seventh Day Adventist Church. And so we're part of the Washington Conference. It's the, the Association of Adventist Churches here in Western Washington. Then that is the part of a larger administrative unit called the North Pacific Union. And one of the divisions of that union is Alaska. Now you know about the millions of people that live in Alaska, right? And it just happens that the the conference, the the Association of Adventist Churches in Alaska, is trying to do more than what they can do by themselves. You know, when you have your churches scattered, you know, there's a church in that village of of 100 (laughs) and in that village of 30. It takes resources beyond what what they have there in Alaska. And so the offering today uh, is a special offering that we take once a year for the Alaska Conference. Uh, to help with the Adventist church work there in that sparsely populated, gorgeous place. Um, We welcome your generosity as we support Alaska and your regular giving that supports the Green Lake Church and all the other projects that you participate in so generously. So money that's placed in the plate that's not designated for something else will go for Alaska and uh, the other giving will go as you direct it. I invite the deacons to stand. Lord in heaven, thank you for allowing us the privilege of managing money, allowing us to spend money to bring pleasure to our own lives, the lives of our family and friends, and to participate in your service here locally and across the United States and around the world. We pray that you will bless the giving that is done through this congregation in the plate and online. Bless those who give, Lord. And may the dollars that they contribute be agents of the kingdom of heaven to bring hope and healing is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.
I'd like to welcome the children to come forward for the children's story. Good morning, boys and girls. Now, today we're going to have a little story about questions. I'm going to have, give you a little test. I'm going to give you an answer. I'm going to give you an example of a question, and you tell me. You raise your hand if you think it's a good thumbs up, if you think it's a nice question, and thumbs down if you think it's not a very nice question. Okay? Well, here's an example. Mom... Can I? Is that a nice question? Mom, can I go to the ice cream store with you? Is that a nice question? How about this one? Mom, do I have to clean my room? Why is that not such a nice question? Why is that not such a nice question? You put your thumb down. Why is it not such a nice question? Any ideas? Do you think your mom likes it when you say, do I have to? What else might your mom have asked you to do? Not clean your room, maybe what? Uh, fold my clothes. Fold your clothes, yeah. Usually it's mom asks you to maybe wash your hands, clean your room, chores, right? Things that you wouldn't choose to do. Why does mom want you to wash your hands? Does she have a reason for it? Yeah. So, so you don't get germs, and you get, and you don't get sick. So your mom has explained the reasons for you at some point, right? But at some point, your mom just wants you to obey when she says, "Clean your room, wash your hands." She doesn't want to explain it every time, does she? Did you want to add something? Um. Don't go. Don't go. Okay. Now, the Bible gives us some examples of interesting stories where people sometimes could ask questions, but they don't. Now, last week I visited the kindergarten division in Sabbath school, and the older youth were presenting a play explaining a Bible story. The story was Moses and the Burning Bush. How many of you know that story? Okay, I like to think of that story as a fire drill story. How many of you are going to be starting school soon? Or are we started school? What's a fire drill? What's a fire drill? Can you explain what a fire drill is? Uh, I know. What is it? Uh, it's something that uh, reminds you of if, it, if you have a fire in your house, you know because if one of those go off, one of those go off, then you know there's a fire. So it's practicing getting ready for a real fire if there should ever be an emergency with a real fire, right? It's practice. Is there a real fire at school when you have a fire drill? Sometimes not, right? But you pretend that there might be a fire so you can learn how to get out safely. Does everybody understand what a fire drill is? Okay, so what would happen if the fire drill alarm went off and you said to the teacher, do I have to go on the fire drill? Is that, is, that a, is that a good question? Is that a nice question or is that a bad question? That's not a nice question. Why? Because it could be a real fire and what would happen to you if you didn't go out on the drill? You could get burned up, right? That's right. 
You could, get, you could get sick or you could get hurt in a fire, a real fire. Now, you know, I was a teacher for many years, and we had fire drills. And there were rules we had to follow for the fire drill. One of the rules was you stayed with your own teacher when you left your room. We all went out to the play field, and we had to keep all the students together, and we had to take roll again with all the student names out on the field. Some kids thought it was recess time. Is fire drill recess time? No, it's real important you stay with your own teacher. So it's very important at times to do exactly what somebody asks you to do and not ask questions like, why do we have to stay with our real teacher? Do you know the answer to that question? So that we know where every child is with an adult to help make sure that they're safe. Okay? Now here's, the st here's how the Bible story is a fire drill story. When, Jesus, when Moses came to the bush and he saw that it seemed to be on fire but wasn't burning up. What questions could he have asked? What's a good question he could have asked? I wonder why that bush looks like it's on fire, right? What, did, what happened when he saw the bush that looked like it was burning? God told Moses, talked to Moses out of the bush and said to do what? What did God ask him to do? Before that, what did he ask him to do? To go back to Egypt and tell the people. But before he did that, he told them the very first thing he told them to do, like a fire drill. The first thing you do in a fire drill is you get your things, you go out the door, right? What did he tell them to do? Take off your sandals because you're standing on holy ground. Now that's like a fire drill. Did Moses say, do I have to? No, what did he do? He took them off immediately. Now, we can go back and we can read that story and we can say, well, I wonder how a bush could be burning and not burning up. We could ask a question about, is that possible? You know, there are things in nature that look like they're burning, but they're not burning up. A volcano. You know, a volcano makes a mountain look like it's on fire, but it's not burning up. It's just getting bigger with all that hot rock coming out. So sometimes the Bible gives us stories where we don't know exactly the scientific explanation, but the story is explaining to us how we should obey God in some way. So that's what I want you to remember. Sometimes a good question to ask about the Bible is, what does God expect me to do? As opposed to, do I have to? Okay, thank you. And now you can take your buckets and collect the offering.
Father in heaven, um, we want to thank you today for the beautiful summer that we've had, the wonderful weather we've enjoyed, um, and also for the rain you brought us today and the rain that makes Seattle such a beautiful place to live. Um, we also want to thank you for the Sabbath rest that you've given us, uh, the day of um, time away from work and the stress of school and whatever life may bring us. Um, thank you for this um, time we have away from all of that. Uh, we want to ask for forgiveness, Lord, um, for the times we've let the stresses of the week um, distract our focus from you and uh, detract from you. And um, we want to ask that you st remain at the center of focus of our, the rest of our week when we leave this place. Um, um, please be in our hearts and our minds. Um, dear Lord, we also want to ask you for uh, guidance as um, for those of you, students who are starting a new school year, um, those who are starting new jobs and um, experiencing transitions in life, please um, direct their paths as they uh, take on new things. Um, Lord, we know that there's uh, areas of the world right now that are experiencing war, and we want to ask for peace in a time of war, and um, whether people are fighting over land or religion or ideals, whatever it is they're fighting over, we know there's people who are caught in the middle of that, and please bring them comfort um, um, in their time of loss or whatever it is, fear that they're experiencing. Um, Lord, there's also many people in the world who are experiencing diseases that are killing, um, killing people, family members, husbands, wives, sons and daughters. We ask that you bring your healing hand on them. We know that you're the ultimate healer. Um, and please also bless the healthcare workers that are there um, serving and um, uh, doing their best to make a difference. Um, Lord, we wanna ask specifically for uh, individuals who are in our congregation um, and um, bring your healing hand upon them as well. We want to specifically pray for Roger Ferris as he's experiencing health issues. Um, also want to pray for Scott Elferich as he's recovering from spine surgery and Angie Abraham as she's recovering from surgery as well. Uh, finally, Lord, we ask for your blessing on Pastor McClarty as he brings the word today. Um, bless him and speak through him and um, bless this congregation as we receive the message. In your name, amen. To whom will you compare me? Who is my equal? asks the Holy One. Look up into the heavens. Who created all the stars? He brings them out like an army, one after another, calling each by its name. Because of his great power and incomparable strength, not a single one is missing. Oh, Jacob, how can you say the Lord does not see your troubles? Oh, Israel, how can you say God ignores your rights? Have you never heard? Have you never understood? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of all the earth. He never grows weak or weary. No one can measure the depths of his understanding. He gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. Even youths will become weak and tired, and young men will fall in exhaustion. But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. 
They will walk and not faint. Some of the Pharisees said, This man Jesus is not from God, for he's working on the Sabbath. Others said, But how could an ordinary sinner do such miraculous signs? So there was a deep division of opinion among them. Then the Pharisees again questioned the man who had been blind and demanded, What's your opinion about the, this man who healed you? The man replied, I think he must be a prophet. The Jewish leaders still refused to believe that the man had been blind and could now see. So they called in his parents. They asked him, is this your son? Was he born blind? If so, how can he now see? His parents replied, we know this is our son and that he was born blind, but we don't know how he can see or who healed him. Ask him, he's old enough to speak for himself. So for the second time, they called in the man who had been blind and told him, God should get the glory for this because we know that this man, Jesus, is a sinner. I don't know whether he's a sinner, the man replied, but I know this, I was blind and now I can see. We took a large risk today. We scheduled three parents of little kids to be on the platform. Um, Brian and Naomi, the only parents that Seth has, are both up here. And Brian uh, Carly was up here and his wife's at the hospital working today, so he has charge of Ethan. And I was asking them before church, you sure this is gonna work? Yeah, we got it covered. <laughs> it's nice to have children to interrupt our, our orderly service. Now I know sometimes that can be problematic. When you do weddings, you plan everything. You, know, you have this exquisite program designed on paper, practiced and rehearsed. And then the, the Bible boy gets halfway up the aisle and freaks out. And some people may be bothered, but most of us realize that's the only part of the wedding you're going to remember. So to all of you parents who dare to blend little ones and church, thank you. We'll put up with you because we get your kids. <laughs> I was almost famous once. At least in my head, I was almost famous. I was working in northern Mississippi. We had 100 acres that needed a fence around it. So I'm putting a fence around this 100 acres. I, this, I was in college. The ground in places was really, really hard. This was eroded, miserable ex-farmland in northern Mississippi where land care practices were quite deficient for decades. And so we had this, this piece of property, needed a fence. The clay in places was so hard that the post hole digger on the back of the tractor would just spin, shave, you know, almost just, just little shavings at a time. And the only way to make the holes was with a, a digging bar and a manual post hole digger. So we'd make these holes about two feet deep about this big around, and in the clay, they would be just, you know, these sides would be really clean, hard sides. And then the next day, we'd start the day by putting posts in the holes we had dug yesterday and then digging new holes. Well, I don't know. I was not very far into this job, and I go to put the post in a hole, and I look down there, and there's a critter in the bottom of the hole. Well, I'm curious about critters. So, you know, I stuck my hand down the hole and fetched this critter out. It was a shrew, a little bitty guy like this. I'm sorry, he was dead. And I figured, you know, the problem is shrews, they have to eat all the time. 
That poor shrew had been in that hole for maybe, who knows, 12 hours. Starved to death. It was a tragedy. But I, I liked little critters. And so I saved it. And at lunchtime, I took it back to the trailer, pulled out my Peterson's Guide to North American Mammals to find out what kind of shrew it was. And I could not match it up to any shrew in the book. But I thought, oh, it's probably an immature or something, you know. Next day, I find another one. I find, I find three shrews. They all look just alike. And they do not match, as far as I can tell, any shrew in the book. And about now, I think I'm going to be famous. I'm going to discover a new species, a new mammal species in North America. Now, would that be cool or what? So on the weekend, I went back home. There was a guy in the church who was on the biology faculty at the uh, University of Memphis. So I gave him my specimens and I said, Dr. Perry, you know, can you, can you find out what these are? Because I don't think, I don't think they're in the book. He said, sure. So he takes it to school and this is before the days of cell phones, so I, the next week when I get back home, you know, as soon as I get in, Dr. Perry, what did you find out about the shrews? Well, it was not a new species. Too bad. But it was very rare. It was obscure. Nobody had studied it. Nobody knew anything about it. It was not in Peterson's field guide. So that, I was right. It wasn't in there. And the biology department would be happy for me to bring them any more specimens that I found. I'm feeling pretty good at this point. I didn't find a new species, but here I am. I am participating in the adventure of science. You know, I've got this little critter that nobody knows really anything about it. And the, the critters I find in the bottom of my post holes are going to contribute to the development of scientific knowledge. That felt really good. I imagine getting my name on an article in a magazine. I mean, uh, in a scientific journal. It didn't happen. Oh, well. So my first response to the shrews in the hole was a scientific response. What is it? And then I began thinking other things, other scientific questions. So where do these guys live? Because I realized that there were holes in certain kinds of ground cover that got shrews in them and holes in other kinds of ground cover. No shrews. Apparently shrews have preferences about what kind of ground cover they live in. And of course, then you want to know, what do they eat? And a terribly important question for a shrew, how long can it live in a hole without any worms in it before it dies? But then a non-scientific question intruded on my mind. I began to think about the shrew that has fallen into the hole, and over the next however many hours, slowly feels its body running out of calories, and then it dies. And I'm thinking about the moral implication of making holes in the ground that kill shrews. If I got specimens for the university, that kind of maybe justified it, but how many, how many specimens was it legitimate to take? The value of the human knowledge we were going to build had to be balanced against the, the cost to shrew them. Now, some of you wouldn't think about that, but some of you I know would, because some of you worry about critters. Some of you, you find a spider in your house, and instead of smashing it, you get something and you catch it and you take it outside and let it go. At least one or two of you do that. And so then I imagine 
putting a stick in the holes so the shrews, if they did fall in, could climb out. At this point, I have clearly left the realm of science. And I would argue I've entered the realm of faith. I'm not going to try to define science or define faith. I'll leave that to other people. Or... But these are labels, convenient labels, for two different neighborhoods of, of human endeavor, human thinking, human experience. And the questions about the value of shrews can never be answered scientifically. Not in the way I'm talking about the value. You could ask the question of economic value and the basic answer is zero. At least that's what was known back then. Who knows what they say now. But when you talk about value, if you dig a post hole and a shrew might fall in it, do you need to put a stick in there so the shrew can get out? That's a question of faith. It's a question of your vision and values. It is not a scientific question. And to take my whole sermon and put it in a very small point, I would argue that if we don't ask the science questions, if we try to shut down the science questions, we're diminishing ourselves. And if we don't ask the questions of faith, we are diminishing ourselves. That the fullness of humanity includes both of these endeavors. Now, different ones of us will, will lean toward one pole or the other of this as our primary way of engaging with the universe. But the fullness of humanity must include both. Both are a gift of God. So let's leave the shrews alone for a minute and talk about John the Gospel of John, chapter 9. Jesus and his disciples are walking along, and they see a man who has been born blind. He's begging. The disciples say, Master, this poor guy, is his problem because he sinned or his parents sinned? This is a purely religious question, a question of faith. There's no way to get at that except religiously. And Jesus answers religiously. He says, neither one. Actually, this happened so the glory of God could be revealed, which is still a little bit of a problem for us, but it's a religious answer. But next, he begins to move out of the realm of pure faith. And he moves into a realm where faith and Science interact with each other. Jesus goes over to the blind man. He spits in the dust, then takes some of that muddy paste, wipes it on the guy's eyes, and tells him, go wash in the pool of Siloam. Now, most of us were going, oh, yuck. But we need to understand in that culture, spittle was regarded as having healing properties. And the spittle of a, of a healer was considered, you know, potent healing. So Jesus was, in that culture, practicing medicine at this point. We don't know yet whether it works. The man goes to the Pool of Siloam. Jesus and his disciples, they head off the other direction. Then the guy gets to the Pool of Siloam, he washes his eyes, and he, he opens his eyes. And he can see! The medicine worked. That would be way cool. So he goes running home. He gets back into his old neighborhood and he's going, look, I can see, I can see. And people come running around him and there's pandemonium and everybody's shouting and hollering and this is fantastic. They've never seen anything quite like this. But there's a little problem. This Healing happened on Sabbath. It was not an emergency. Now, Jewish people had a very clear understanding. Sabbath, all Sabbath rules were secondary to saving human life. If there was an emergency, you saved the human life no matter how much work it took. So let's be clear on that. But this was not an emergency. 
you know, it was routine. This guy had been blind for decades. So they grab the guy and they're off to see the religious experts. They tell the story to the religious experts and there is an immediate um, conflict because some of the religious experts said, this is fantastic, wow, this man must have an incredible connection with God. And other religious experts said, this man is a stark raving sinner because he just broke the Sabbath. We can't have that happening. I mean, what would happen if we lost the Sabbath? So obviously he couldn't be from God because he did something we think threatens our Sabbath. So there's controversy back and forth. They haul the guy back in. So tell us again what happened. (laughs) And he says, look, I already told you. Uh, If I tell you again, are you going to become believers too? Up to this point, all of the questions that have been asked of the man are questions that would be relevant if you were looking at the story scientifically. What happened? Who did it? Are you really the same person that was blind? You know, and, and they, they question his parents. You know, they, they're, they're investigating the event. What happened? That's good science. It's the kinds of questions that science can ask. What happened? What happens? And now the Pharisees ask him the faith question. So this guy that put the mud on your eyes, what about him? What do you think of him? The man said, he's a prophet. No doubt about it, he's a prophet. Pharisees are troubled really, really troubled because they have a religious conviction that is profoundly challenged by the story that this man is telling. They want the man to resolve the problem. Look, I... You need to just give glory to God and forget this Jesus guy. And and I love what the man does. He says, look, theology, that's your department. Here's what I know. I was blind and now I can see. Now, how did the religious leaders deal with this inconvenient fact? They kicked him out. Now hear me, the Adventist church has some opinions about the age of the earth. For a hundred years we've had opinions, and in that hundred years there has been an accumulating weight of evidence that those, that that's not a good scientific story. There are quiet voices in Adventist academia who keep reminding us our theology and some of the facts don't go together real well. And that's true. It's incontrovertible. And so what are some church leaders wanting to do? Let's kick out the scientists. It would solve the problem. If we get rid of the blind guy and his story, we can go right back to the way we thought before with no problems. The church leaders imagine if we can just get rid of a few of these nagging scientists, we can go back to the way things used to be where there were no problems. Folks, there was never a time when there were no problems. (laughs) And kicking people out who point out inconvenient facts is no resolution. Not one we can be proud of anyway. 
Now let's be clear. This, this story makes another point as well. At least I'm going to make another point. There are certainly plenty of voices in the world who would insist faith is irrelevant, that science can tell us what we need to know. Some will go so far as to say, if the question cannot be answered from science, it's not an important question. And that is sheer foolishness. Yeah, I'm, I'm up here talking in church, I'll say that. If you're across the table from me, I'll try to be a little more polite as we argue this out. But the church stands up and says, the attempt to describe hum human existence from science, and only from there, is foolishness. You cannot account for the fullness of humanity. Because from science, you cannot answer the simple question, should I put a stick in the hole for the shrew? Science can tell you how long before the shrew dies. But it can't tell you whether you should care if the shrew dies. That assignment of value to that little bit of life comes from some other place. And it's a place where most atheists also live because most, athe most atheists will couch their atheism in a profound regard for the life that's here. But that regard does not come from atheism or from science. It comes from someplace else. The best place to talk about it comes from our gut. <laughs> I suppose it's someplace up here, but we experience it here. In this story, when you look at the questions that would be the scientific questions, what happened? Who did it? I mean, yeah, what happened? Is this really the guy? No. After you've answered all those questions, you, you've, you've just gotten to the place of the most interesting question, which is the question the Pharisees asked the blind man. What do you think of the healer? What about him? What about Jesus? And for 2,000 years, people have been wrestling with that question. And we still do. It's far more interesting than any particular question about the man. How long he'd been blind. What was the exact process that happened. All those, those are, yeah, whatever. The question that causes us to remember the story is the question, what do you think of Jesus? The questions of faith actually are the most profoundly human questions. So my daughter is working at Rosario Marine Biological Field Station this summer doing research on a giant sea creature called an isopod. It's four centimeters long. I went up to visit her, and the first thing I thought, and I don't know if we use this term here in Seattle, I grew up in the South. I said, that looks like a roly-poly. And my, my daughter's uh, partner goes, yep, roly-polies are a terrestrial isopod. These are marine isopods. <laughs> I thought, oh, cool, I'm, see, I'm, I'm a good scientist. I got the connection right away. These are swimming roly-polies. So they're, they're collecting these isopods. They go a few miles away from Rosario to a place where there's beds of eelgrass, whatever that is. And off this eelgrass, they collect these critters called isopods. And they bring them back, and they put them in an isopod hotel that they had built. I mean, this was plush accommodations. Each isopod had its own little room, and every room was supplied with a constant flow of fresh seawater pumped out of the sound. I mean, they looked, I could see these isopods had smiles on their faces. At the end of the summer, the last few days, they're done. Some of the isopods, they shipped back to Walla Walla for further research, but they had a whole bunch of isopods, seagoing roly-polies, 
They had a bunch of these isopods that they didn't need anymore. They weren't going to run the hotel in perpetuity. They're shutting down the isopod hotel. So what did they do with these isopods? Now, if you'd asked me, I'd have put them in a bucket, walked 10 feet over to the water off the field station and dumped them. No, 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 these girls didn't do that. Excuse me, these women didn't do that. They put them in some kind of container that would continue to aerate and keep the isopods happy, and they drove the few miles back to the eel bed place and released them back into that habitat where they had taken them from. Why? They're doing scientific research, and then they do this act, which is common among scientists. I mean, this is not an unusual act, to take the, the quote, surplus specimens and put them back in their native habitat. That's, that's common practice. But why? What is the value that drives us to do that? That's no more scientific than my claim to have seen a smile on the face of those isopods. Now, it, it's far more dignified and important. I obviously did not see any smiles. But there is a value for life. There's a respect for life, for nature, for creation that is common in the sciences, but does not come from science itself. It is a value that comes from some place that's much closer to the label faith. A few years ago, I don't know, four or five years ago, I was listening to a couple of people I know argue about the relationship of faith and science. And the science guy, he was really trying to nail this other person who didn't know much about science and really didn't care much about it. And he's saying, look, if you want to help the world, teach people science. All you're preaching, what? It's not good for anything. In the last 50 years, the production of food has outpaced the growth of population so that it is far less likely to st people will starve to death now than, than 75 years ago. He said, what made that difference? It was science. It's true. Science is this incredible tool if you want to feed millions of people and you ask, how do I do that? You're going to ask a scientist, not a theologian. At least if you're smart. But then, if you ask the question, we've got plenty of food, why should we bother about those people over there who don't? You cannot ask a scientist. Well, you can't ask science. Why do we care about those who have less? It is because of values that come from some place called faith. Is it better to use science to make an IED or to grow a better tomato? Science can't answer the question. They are both fascinating, interesting scientific projects. One is noble and one is terrible. And even that judgment cannot be made from inside science. That's coming from faith and yet we're all going, yeah, yeah, right, yeah. I'd... Saving life is more noble than taking life. Science is good at both. God has given us science as this incredible tool to know the world, manage the world, change the world. And if we as a church try to squelch science because it brings inconvenient facts, we are diminishing a tool that God put in our hands. 
we will do less well in the mission God has called us to. On the other hand, if we become so enamored with the power of science that we fail to honor and give attention to the vision that faith can give us, we will have developed powerful tools and we have no direction. We don't know what to do with them. So my appeal for us as a church and as individuals in the church, follow the calling that God has given you. If he's called you to be a theologian, go for it and do it well. If he's called you to be a scientist, do it well. If he's called you to paint pictures, paint beautiful pictures. If he's called you to feed babies, do it well. There's all these things that are part of being fully human. Let's learn here to respect the tools of science and the vision of faith and participate with God in making the world a better place.
Let's pray. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen.